it's not too early to start thinking about your harvest plan for this fall. And I say harvest plan, I'm not talking about cutting corn. I'm talking about the deer harvest plan where you hunt. Pretty good. A lot of folks my age or so was literally raised when it was almost considered a sin to harvest a doe. And that mindset still exists in some areas. But you know, research and a lot of publications have clearly shown that deer consume about 5%, give or take, of their body weight a day, and that's dry weight, all the moisture taken out of plants. So deer eat a lot. And if you've got a lot of deer on the property or low quality habitat, then there's not gonna be enough groceries for all the deer to go around. There's always that balance, number of deer, whatever that is, that may be 100 deer per square mile in Iowa, just throwing out a number, and closed canopy forest here in the Ozarks or in the Smoky Mountains or Maine or somewhere, maybe 10 deer per square mile. But you wanna find that balance where there's enough groceries for every deer to be healthy, and if you want better quality deer, then you need even more groceries for them to express their full genetic potential. Well, the area right behind me right now is probably producing, I don't know, 50 pounds per acre all year long of quality forage. Now, if we got a 100 pound doe and she's eating five pounds a day, remember that's dry weight, and that often takes 15 to 17 pounds wet weight, or as we see growing out there, to equal five pounds dry weight a day. So you got one doe eating 17 pounds a day on a place that's producing 50 pounds of deer food per acre, you can't have many deer per square mile. So I think most places tend to run more deer than they need for their habitat. And there's very few places that have too few deer and they can allow that population to expand. There are some and maybe there'd be a bad EHD outbreak. Boy, I sure hope there's not, but that can reduce a deer herd rapidly just you know in a few months. And you may need to back off that doe harvest for a season or two to let that deer herd come back up but it's not based on numbers again. It should be based on the amount of quality groceries year round, not just you know in one season, to the amount of mouths competing for those quality groceries. A lot of people like high quality deer and high quality deer are not only having more fawns, healthier fawns and bigger antlers, but they're providing better venison for us to consume. And that's the end result of hunting, or is for a lot of us, is putting healthy, really healthy protein and many other nutrients in the freezer for our family. When deer are starving or their ribs are showing and they're way below their genetic potential, that venison that we're consuming or feeding our families isn't as high a quality as it could be. So there are a lot of reasons to work to match the number of deer with the amount of groceries. And you can tackle this a couple of ways. You can significantly increase the amount of quality habitat, or you can reduce the amount of mouths competing for quality forage. Some states make this easy. Georgia, uh, at least the last time I bought a tag there, you got 12 deer tags when you went wherever and bought a tag. 10 of those were antlerless, only two could be antlered. So you had the opportunity, every hunter had the opportunity to harvest a lot of deer. A lot of states, about 16 the last I checked, have DMAP or Deer Management Assistance Programs. These are primarily in the Southeast and there will be a state biologist come out usually and make a recommendation for your property and they will give you a number of tags for the property. It's not based on how many hunters, but a number of tags. A couple of years ago, Missouri started experimenting with a DMAP program, and that program's expanding. That's a great thing. Some of us have enough you know, family members, employees that, that like the archery hunt. In Missouri, you can buy an unlimited number of archery tags, at least in our unit, without much of the state. So we're able to get the necessary doe harvesting. And here at the Proven Grounds and many of our projects, we end up harvesting about five does per every buck, five does per every buck. And you might think, oh my gosh, I run out of deer. Well, we've been making this show 14 years and you know, doing it decades before then. We've never ran out of deer yet. And you gotta remember that usually your neighbors aren't harvesting that many does or antlerless deer. We prefer does over button bucks. So you're kind of setting a balance because they're harvesting bucks. You're gonna have to harvest does for them. It's rare you have a property large enough that the deer herd is centered on your property. So right now's the time, and especially in August. August tends to be 
a low threshold for available food. Late summer and late winter are stress periods for deer. And if you're seeing not enough groceries, then you know you need to remove, you need to reduce that deer population, which is doe harvest. Harvesting bucks is not taking the breeding potential or the reproductive potential out of deer herd. So, you know, come August, if in your utilization cages to four inches a foot or two tall and outside it's lip high, or you're walking in the timber and man, all the smilax, all the ragweed's been heavily browsed on and other what we call ice cream plants are plants that are really preferred by deer. They're heavily browsed. You know, no matter how big antlers are, or how many does are making fawns at your property, that deer herd is not cooking on all eight cylinders. It's not expressing its full genetic potential. And you're gonna have to significantly increase the amount of quality habitat or reduce the amount of mouths competing for quality forage. You need to start thinking about that doe harvest now. There's not a magic recipe, 100 acres, 200 acres. If you've had no doe harvest in the past, you need to up it and then next year, see how the habitat responds. If you've been having a doe harvest and they're still browsing your food plots down and all your native vegetation, you know, whatever it is, you need to harvest more. And if they're really significantly impacting the habitat where you hunt, don't, you know, increase it one fold. You may need to increase it five fold or 10 fold to start making a difference on the habitat quality and therefore the deer herd quality where you hunt. Growing Deer is brought to you by Bass Pro Shops and Cabela's. Also by Green Cover Food Plots, Winchester, Moultrie Mobile, Fleet Outdoor Apparel, Morel Targets, RTP Outdoors, Fourth Arrow, Scorpion Venom Archery, Case IH Tractors, Ward Laboratories, Burris Optics, National Land Realty, G5 Broadheads, Prime Bows, and Redneck Hunting Blinds. Hopefully I've got you encouraged to take some does and the biggest mistake I see in doe harvest isn't shooting button bucks or shooting shed antler bucks. That's gonna happen a little bit if you have an aggressive doe harvest. The biggest mistake is not starting early enough. Our bow season starts September 15th and I can tell you right now, if a mature doe is standing out there broadside in my safety range, my accurate range, I'm letting the prime send an arrow and I'll be so excited. To get your doe harvest objectives on most properties, if you're gonna meet your quota, you need to start on opening day. A lot of people say, I'm gonna wait till after the rut. I'm gonna, I don't wanna disturb bucks. That's, research has just shown time and time again, that's nonsense. Matter of fact, here at the Proving Grounds, we've shared this over and over. A lot of the mature bucks we've harvested have been out of the same blind or stand where we had just harvested a doe during that same hunt. The bow or the gun had went off, there's a dead doe laying right in front of us. And instead of pushing bucks away, bucks come in seeking that doe that we've already harvested. They're down there smelling it, nudging it, not just during the rut. So we start opening day and we work consistently throughout the season until we reach our doe harvest objective. Some people look at doe harvest as a chore. I mean, I, I get excited when I see a big old doe come down the trail and come to full draw or settle those crosshairs on there. I've been doing this a long time. I'm still excited every time I see a deer, whether I pass it or I think about making venison. Oh, it's all fun, man. Whew. A lot of y'all know I'm a kidney transplant patient and I do my healthcare work at the Mayo Clinic and they just rave that a lot of my diet is wild game. It's so healthy, it doesn't have all those additives or antibiotics and wild game should be eating a high diversity of plants, which means they're gonna have a fuller mineral content, a better spread of nutrient content in that meat than a cow that's finished out on grain. It's like comparing a wild caught salmon to a hatchery raised salmon or a grain-fed beef to a free pasture grass-fed beef. That research is well published and there's no comparison in the quality of meat as it relates to human health. Well, the same is true about free-ranging wild deer that have high quality habitat and can pick and choose what they want to eat daily. Remember deer are what we call concentrate select feeders. They eat the best and leave the rest. And we don't understand it all yet, but clearly they're not just selecting for high protein or you know, high iron. They're selecting on secondary and tertiary compounds 
if you're really into this, flavonoids and other stuff is really coming to play and how that relates to human health. So we process all the deer we harvest. I got a, you know, a big family and a lot of employees. We all share in that venison. Everyone sticks their hand in our freezer and it takes a lot of deer to keep that freezer full. If you're looking at doe harvest as a chore or only a management opportunity, you're really missing a boat. You need to be looking about that huge blessing of being able to have and share. Be a provider. Hunters were originally a provider. They provided high quality meat for their family and friends. And I think that's one of the most honorable badges we can wear as a hunter, is providing high quality meat to our family and friends. Yeah. I'm happy for you, Thank you so much, Grant. Is that deer? White tailed deer are one of the most studied species of wildlife on the planet, and we've learned a lot, but sometimes there's a gap between good quality research that's been repeated over and over and that talk in hunting camps. Hopefully this stuff will, we're sharing will help you and your hunting friends make better choices this fall. You know, we all need to make good choices every day and slow down and just enjoy creation, have a good walk, but even more importantly than that, take time every day to be quiet and seek the Creator's will and apply it to your life. Thanks for watching Growing Deer.